right. Check my sound. Sounds, no, no, yeah, there's sound, good. So as far as I can tell, I'm looking good. I've got a, quite a few of you tuning in, so welcome to everybody um, joining us. I'm going to try today uh, to present to you the 45 minute shooter. I've had some ideas. I actually pre-coded a little bit, which I don't usually do. I never know quite how this is gonna go. Um, so wish me luck and follow along. Feel free to talk and chat I don't if it's turned on. I'm kind of new to this platform. I've used it a few times in the past, but I just thought it would be cool for this. And then it'll end up, I believe, as a YouTube video when I'm done. All right, so let's go over to take a look at Greenfoot and sort of define our project. All right, let's make a nice new scenario. And then we'll start ourselves a approximate 45 minute timer. So we will call this uh, 45 minute space shooter. And here we go. So the first thing I'm gonna do is bring in a bunch of graphics. Now, as you saw, because uh, I had this folder open, I pre-made some graphics here to work for us. I've got a space background. I've got some projectiles. I don't even know how these are gonna look because I never really got a finished example going. I got a player and an enemy so they can be similar with different colors. And I even made a robot in case we have a chance to add that. So I'm gonna grab all these graphics. And uh, if you're not aware, when you create a Greenfoot project, inside it is an images folder. And inside that images folder is where you need to put your images. So I just made a new one. It's pro Did I save it here? You don't see it. 45 minutes shoot. No, where did I save it? Sorry guys, one second. Did I not put it in the same place? Oh no, I didn't. Let's fix that. All right. Okay, and let's bring in the graphics. So uh, this newly created folder here, it'll create the images folder for you. Okay. Nice. Let's, uh, cool timing windows. Let's try that again. All right, let's try this again. I hope it's still pasteable. No, oh, of course I lost it. Let's try that. Let's grab it. Copy. And so now we have some images. And this is important because in a perfect world, I think I would rather actually have um, draw these images. As you can tell, my drawing skills are pretty limited. I drew these. They're simple shapes that I drew in paint.net. Um, so this way we don't have to draw them, but it would be cool if you're using geometric shapes to actually draw them in Greenfoot with drawing commands. But anyway, you'll notice that they're named nice and neat. Oh, this one should start with a lowercase letter to be consistent. When you're naming your files, and by the way, my timer hasn't started yet. Uh, when you're naming your files, you should always consider, did I not just rename that? Okay, Windows. Weird. There it is. Um, when you're naming your files, you should be consistent. Uh, a lot of students come to me with errors saying, why am I not loading my file? Well, you know, if you have a capital letter on the file name and you don't have a capital letter in your code, it won't work. So just be consistent. However your files are named, name them the same each time. So let's go in here and let's uh, set the image for the world. So as I like to make good habits, I'm gonna do this the good way. And if you're new to Greenfoot, if you're one of my grade 11 students joining me, and none of this really means all that much to you yet, just follow along. But we wanna use a variable for the image. We don't, and, and we're gonna use code to load it rather than just doing set image. So I'm for most of my classes, I'm gonna do this. Uh, private Greenfoot image, image. And that just basically gives me a place to store this. And then when I'm creating my world, first of all, I want my world to be bigger than 800 by 600. I mean, bigger than 600 by 400. I think I decide I'm gonna go with 1,024 uh, by 600. I think worked out pretty well. And then I wanna set my background image. So I'm gonna say image equals new 
green foot image. I believe it's called space one dot JPEG. We'll know pretty quickly if I'm wrong. And then I'm going to say set background image. Now, just as a side note, when you set an image as your background in the world, it has to be a fully opaque image. If there's even the slightest bit of transparency, it simply won't work. Uh, let's see if this works or if I, there it is. So the file name became the image. I set it as my background. I set it as a bigger size. And now I have some space to work with. So let's go ahead and make our player. That's going to be sort of our first uh, subclass here. But before we do that, I want to introduce you actually to something in Greenfoot you may never have seen before called the Smooth Mover. The Smooth Mover is a simple way to, to add uh, more precise movement to your game. If you've seen this before, where did it just go? If you've never seen Smooth Mover before, what it effectively does is it lets you make actors able to set locations based on doubles instead of um, just ints. And that can really make your game smoother, which is why it's called Smooth Mover. I'm not going to get too into it right now. I have for grade 11s, I'll do a whole a little lesson on Smooth Mover later. But I'm going to make player, I don't want to use that image. Uh, I want to make player a subclass of uh, Smooth Mover so that player can move smoothly. Okay, so inside player, there's a few things that I want to set up. Now I'm going to copy over a few uh, variable declarations rather than making you watch me type them. I set up some of the script. Like I said, I have an incomplete script that I'm following here. So hopefully it all works out, but this should save us some time. Ooh, I named, I want to rename my world game world. I'm going to do that in a minute, but I just um, gave myself a few instance variables. The first is an image, which is sort of like what I did a minute ago. I want to have a mouse info and I'm going to explain that as well. In order to do my smooth movement, I want to have a few things. This is going to be a space shooter, so I thought I'd add a little simple acceleration, deceleration mechanic and a brake. So you can hit the brakes if you want to slow down. Otherwise, your spaceship kind of keeps moving and slowly decelerates, even though I know there's no friction in space. Uh, not accurate. Uh, and we have hit points. So that's going to be sort of our variables for player. Now, before I go any further, let's rename our world. Renaming your world is not as simple as it may seem. The best way to do it is to rename it right here and then to also rename the constructor. If you have created your own constructors, you're more aware of this, but if you just let it sort of create the code for you, you'll notice that this matches this. And if you're in my grade 12 class, you know that this is called a constructor. It has the same name as the class. It's a method that call, gets called to create this object. So now my player, let's see, game world should now be a thing. Whoa. Okay, that error is resolved. Let's continue building our player. So I actually want to set up something, um, set up some stuff. Now, one thing about Greenfoot, if you're kind of experienced in programming, but you aren't experienced in Greenfoot, actors don't come with constructors. For some strange reason, you have to add it. It's very useful. You probably should add it. The other thing actors don't come with, they come with an act method, which is really nice because they generally do need those, but not always. And um, I don't know why they come with this and not with the other things. So there's a constructor is one thing, which is sort of when we build this actor. The other useful method that a lot of people don't know about, uh, even me for the first year or two or three that I programmed in Greenfoot, is this method called added to world. This is a method that automatically, automatically, uh, but it is magic, gets called by, sorry, I just want to make sure everything's good here. Shooter game speed run. Yeah, cool. I, I can go with that comment. Um, add it to world gets called automatically by Greenfoot, and this can be very, very useful. So um, I'll leave that there and we'll add to it in a second again, automatically gets called, right? So when you get added to the world, this is a place where you can put code and you don't have to say, if this is my first act, if I used to make a big workaround for this, I didn't know there was an added to world method. And then I realized that and I went, why isn't that there? So there it is. Uh, so I'm going to set up some variables. Uh, and again, I'm going to just sort of paste this in and we'll uh, go through it. I'm setting up my image to be player.png and this set image command always comes next. Set image basically means take this green foot image and make it the one that represents me in the world. Um, you can only have one image set at a time, but you could set lots of images to, for example, do animation if you wanted to reset the images every so often. I have a uh, couple of variables here that might not mean anything to us quite yet, but will in a few minutes. I have a speed, which is my starting speed. I'm going to start at the speed of zero. And so this isn't how fast I can move. This is how fast I am moving. Max speed is going to be how fast I can move. 
the acceleration is going to be basically every act if I'm holding my accelerator button which is my forward movement button um, how much do you want to add to my speed decel is if I let go of the button how fast should I decelerate and brake factor is if I actually press backwards how much faster as a multiple should I decelerate beyond decel if you don't have any idea what I just said don't worry it'll hopefully make sense when I put it into context for you the next thing I want to do, um, I have this variable here, this instance variable called game world. And you may have been wondering what the heck that's for. Well, I want to always have a way to refer to the world without having to call get world every act. So I'm going to actually save a reference to my world right here in the added to world function. And so I'm going to say that uh, game world equals game world w. This is a cast. If you've never seen grade 11s, you might just be seeing casting as in from a double to an integer, or from an integer to a double. When you put a type in brackets next to an object or next to a thing, it will convert it, if you will. Um, and so this is going to convert this from a regular world. It comes in as a world. Greenfoot can't predict what kind of world it's going to be. But it's going to turn it into a game world. It's going to cast it because you know it is one. You're only ever going to add the player to the game world. It's a little bit dangerous because if you add the player to a different world, this might not work. Or, sorry, it would not work. It would give you an error. Uh, but as long as you're always adding it to a game world, this is safe. And this way, for the rest of the program, I have a way to access my methods that I put in game world. I can always say game world dot do whatever I want it to do, and I will get it to do whatever I want it to do. So in the player's act method, we're going to do a little bit of mouse management. But I personally, one of my biggest pieces of advice and something students get stuck on is that we can't have um, more than one call to the method greenfoot.getMouseInfo. Greenfoot.getMouseInfo tells you, any given act, what happened to the mouse during the act before. Remember, this is happening in, in real time, so it's not what's happening right this instant. While your act is going on, Greenfoot's actually in another thread saying, hey, what's, let's get ready for the next act. That's available to you by this method called greenfoot.getMouseInfo. But it's only available once, and once you grab it, you can't call it again. So I always put it in world, and I'm going to demonstrate that now. I'm going to make a mouse info object here. I'm going to say private mouse info mouse. Okay, and then I'm going to make an act method for world. So just like um, player didn't have a constructor by default, Greenfoot didn't put it there, world doesn't have an act method. But if you make one, it will get called just like the act method in player. It will get called every act, 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 act. You don't have to call it. So here I'm going to say um, mouse equals greenfoot dot get mouse info, and this is going to pull the mouse every act. I want to make this available to all of the other classes as well. So I'm going to make a public method here, public mouse info, uh, called get mouse info. Now this this method has the same name, but I'm not going to be calling it on greenfoot. I'm going to be calling it on my world. And basically the idea here is every act. The world's going to say, hey, check, get the latest mouse info. And then during that act, any other actor that acts will have the opportunity to call this method if it needs to know what the mouse is doing. For now, it might just be your player. But you might have other parts of the program later that want to hear from the mouse that for some reason need to know what the mouse is up to. Um, you might even in your world have, you, want, you might want to use the mouse in your world to do things like, did a button get clicked? You know, is it going to be game over? Um, and also in your player. So you need it in more than one place but you can only call that method once. And that's why I set it up this way. So this is simply gonna return mouse. Now in my player, I can actually find out every act, what the mouse is doing by asking the world. So I'm gonna say mouse equals, now I'm gonna make my own, I have my own mouse info here. This was one of the variables that I pasted in. So I'm sort of ready to hold it. I don't have to declare that or initialize it each, I don't have to redeclare it each time. Uh, and I'm gonna say mouse equals uh, game world, which is that reference to the world dot get mouse info. So every act, I can find out what's happening. Uh, game world, sorry, is not a method. Game world is an object. And then I'm going to say if mouse is not equal to null, you always have to do mouse check, uh, null checks with the mouse. You always have to do a check to see is the mouse um, in the world. For example, if you move your mouse off of the green foot window, Mouse info is null. It can no longer give you info like, hey, what x, y coordinate am I over? What actor am I interacting with, if any? It can't give you that information if the mouse is not on Greenfoot. Or let's imagine the mouse gets unplugged or something like that. So we always want to check if the mouse is actually present. If it is, um, we want to do some stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do, which is, um, I think, uh, 
a cool command. Uh, it used to be something you would have to know the math in order to do, but Greenfoot added this in, uh, I want to say 2.2, early in my Greenfoot days, I used to do this with math. I used to tell students, check out this trigonometry. You can use it. I would give, them, give it to them as a method, and then voila, Greenfoot came out with it. And the method's called turn towards, which basically will set your angle to make your angle equal to the right angle to face that target. And the target that I'm going to turn towards is mouse.getx and mouse.gety. So the x and the y mouse coordinate. Now, um, turn towards is really neat, but you can't just say mouse. You have to actually give it an x and a y. Sometimes you could make a helper method that would just take an actor or whatever, but this should effectively, if your mouse is in the world, turn towards the mouse. And let's see how well we're, let's let's check on our progress here. Um, where is our so we don't actually have a player in our world yet. Let's fix that. Uh, so right here, we're going to create the player. We always want to have a reference to our player, not just sort of add a new one to the world. Uh, so we'll make an object here where we can store the player. And then we will say um, player equals new player. Right now, our constructor is blank, so it's just open bracket, close bracket, add object player, and we want to add it right in the middle of our world. So that would be 512 by 300 would be the center of our 1024 by 600 world. And if I did this correctly, we should now see, there we go. And if the other part's done correctly, there we go. So the actor is now facing the mouse. You see the pointy end of that triangle is the, is the, is the uh, front of my ship. Now, speaking of which, I want to talk just for a moment about the angle here. So when you create a when you create an image for this purpose, where you're going to want to use its angle in like a turn method, make sure that you always face, this is the enemy one, make sure that you always face it to the right. This is angle zero. So don't face up. Sometimes people want to face up. Facing to the right is the zero degree angle if you're going to use this sort of turning based uh, using, you know, move and turn rather than set location to move your stuff around. So if you're going to make a if you're going to work like this and you're going to create your own graphics or if you have to re you find some graphics and you you know maybe they're facing up you got to turn them before you import them. You could import them first, but I always like to get my graphics set up in a graphics editor and then import it rather than trying to import it and then do things like rotations and and scaling and stuff. So so far so good. My character's there, he turns. Uh, and now I think we need to teach him how to move. So let's go back to our player. And where's our player? Where's our code? Sorry, there we go. And so after we get the mouse info, we've turned, um, oh, sorry, wrong class, player. After we get the mouse info and we've turned towards, uh, the next thing I want to do is one of three things. I want to either accelerate if the key is being pressed down, I'm going to use W for forward. I want to decelerate if nothing is being pressed. And I want to break if the down button or the S is being pressed. So the first one I'm going to detect is the forward button. I'm going to say if greenfoot dot is key down W. There are different ways of getting key input in greenfoot. And this is by far the simplest one that is key down. Um, and I'm going to say speed equals, I'm going to use a little trick here. You may have seen me use in the past math.min, uh, not main, math.min, max speed or speed plus Excel. So what this is basically saying is I want greenfoot. Dot, what did I do wrong here? You maybe meant is key. Oh yeah, I missed a letter. That's pretty good. Um, what it's basically saying is I want to move either max speed or speed, my current speed plus acceleration, whichever is lower, right? So in other words, if speed plus acceleration is higher than my maximum speed, I'm going to take the lower value, which is my maximum speed. You could replace this with an if statement, but this is more efficient and it's a good habit to get into. It saves you a couple lines of code. Uh, it's just a neat little, I promise you some neat little clever tricks. You've probably seen me do that one before, uh, but that's definitely one worth knowing. Uh, so I'm going to mark this oh, before I do this. I'm just going to mark this here as this is accelerating. Excel, okay. And then here we're going to have decel. So this is when we're slowing down. Um, what's going on here today? Else if, oh, wrong bracket, that's why. Else if, decel, okay. Uh, else if, I need a condition. So the 
the opposite is going to be breaking. Greenfoot dot is he down, and we're going to go with s. And so in that case, we're going to say speed equals the higher of zero because we don't want to decelerate below zero, or speed minus a certain deceleration factor. So I'll just speed it along here and paste it in. So it's the higher value of zero, right? So this is going to make sure it never goes below zero. I'm effectively flooring it here um, at zero. And then, or math times, and I said decel times break factor, because I told you break factor is going to multiply my deceleration. So it's making me decelerate much harder if I press down. Finally, I'm going to use else to say basically, if they're not pressing, you know, it's kind of like in the car, if you're not pressing the gas and you're not pressing the brake, you still need to do something. So in this case, I'm going to apply normal decel. So it's going to be a similar equation to the last one. Um, and this is, so I would actually, instead of, sorry, let's call this uh, braking decel. So as in using your brakes, braking decel, and this we'll call natural decel. Yes, someone's going to tell me there's no deceleration from friction in space, and that's okay. I can live with that um, scientific inaccuracy. All right, let's see how that looks. Oh, before we, now we actually have to do something with the speed, so let's move at my speed. Now, you might have wondered why I'm using this smooth mover thing. The reason is I want my speed to be able to change by very small amounts. Every act, I want my speed to change by 0 0.1. Greenfoot can't actually move your thing less than one full pixel, but it can do the math. And if it's doing 60 frames per second and you move 0 0.1 pixels per second, it can do the math and see that it takes you 10 acts to move one pixel, right? It can do that, that rounding for you so that even though it's not actually moving the same number of pixels per act anymore, it's figuring out which act to move in order to achieve the overall speed you're after. So here I can accelerate and decelerate smoothly. And let's see what this actually looks like now. And I can accelerate and decelerate, right? So I accelerate, that's my maximum speed. But when I let go of, I don't know if you guys can hear my keyboard, I'm letting go now. It falls a little, right? Let go now, let go now, right? But if I press the brake, it stops much faster. Brake. So that's kind of some cool, uh, simple acceleration based movement. If I had more time, I would deal with this. What happens when your mouse, you know, when you're moving and you get like close to the mouse? Um, but that would take a little extra time, and then I just decided to skip that for now. But this is, so this is a good start. Now let's make something to shoot. Okay, so we're gonna need some enemies. For now, I'm just gonna make the class enemy. And um, I'm not gonna do much except give it an image. So let me just check what the image is called for this. The image should be called enemy1.png. I think I was going to make an enemy too, and I didn't get there. I think I actually have it right up on paint.net. But regardless, let's make him an image, just like always, private green foot image, image. Okay, and then I'm going to make a constructor, public enemy. And in here, I'm going to say image equals new green foot image. And it was called, what did I just say? Enemy1.png. One, enemy one and set image image to make the actor actually take on this image. Now I'm just going to spawn a couple of enemies um, in sort of random locations. So when I shoot, I have something to shoot at. And then later, hopefully, we'll have time to fix their spawners. If I don't finish this, by the way, in the about 40, I'll give myself a few extra minutes. But if it gets a little out of hand, don't worry. Um, I will always happily say uh, to be continued and continue it. But I think I can get through most of this. I think I can make this pretty good. I hope. All right, so um, let's add those enemies, sorry, to the world. Let's just make, now there's two ways to add objects. There's the persistent way where I've created a player object, but right now I'm just gonna add some, what I would call anonymous enemies to the screen. Um, they're being remembered because Greenfoot knows what they are, but they don't really, um, they don't really uh, get saved. You'd have to sort of find them from the world or something. This is not This is okay when you're adding enemies because enemies might be sort of self-sufficient things, kind of like the bugs in my bug simulation where they just go around and do their thing until they get destroyed. You don't have to refer back to them. Anyway, I'm, gonna ref I'm just gonna add this one. I'll add it, let's say a little bit away from the left, let's say 30 pixels away from the left and somewhere in the middle on the Y axis. So I'll give it a nice uh, 200 and then I'll add another one 
in a different direction, new enemy. And I'm going to add this one uh, near the other end of the screen. So let's say at 900 and well, that's 30 from the end, 994, I believe. Uh, and we'll make it uh, at 400. So it'll be kind of a, a offset a little. And let's see if that looks like what we want. Yep, there we go. Now these enemies are both uh, currently facing the right because that's their default direction. That's a, if, we, if we set them with a direction of zero, the default starting direction is facing to the right. So that's okay, but I actually want to make them face the player, which is just makes it look cooler. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here as a shortcut, and I might improve on this later, I, I will improve on this later, is every act, I'm just gonna turn towards the player. So I, I need to get the player, and then I'm gonna turn towards it. Easiest way to get the player would actually be to save it, so I don't have to get it every act. I could every act say, hey, world, find me the player, give me a reference to it, but instead, I'm gonna save it when I create this. So I'm gonna say private player, player, and I'll take it as a parameter here. I'll say player, and I'll say this.player equals player. I'm gonna get an error now where my enemy is being created because I have to pass it a player. And my player is gonna be this persistent object that I've got right here. So I'm gonna copy that right there and right there. And now they both know who the player is and they'll know it for the whole time they exist. So let's make them turn towards the player. So every act, uh, enemy in his act method here is going to turn towards player.getx, player.gety. And there they are. So if, if I move around the screen, you'll notice they are actively looking at me, which is kind of neat. Uh, and of course, that will also allow them to shoot at me, which is our goal here. But right now, no one has anything to shoot. I'm clicking my button, which I would love to make shots come out and nothing is coming out. So let's make our projectile with about, if I started at about 106, I have about 15, 18 minutes. I don't know, some six plus, I got some time left, 21 minutes. I think I got this, guys. All right, so let's make projectiles now. Now projectiles are also gonna be smooth movers because I want them to move smoothly. Um, I'm going to try, and this is where I might get stuck. I'm going to try to make these projectiles fully generic. And I usually don't do this in this demo because it takes a little bit more work. I did a little bit of pre-coding. Generic sort of means I can use the same projectile class for players shooting at enemies as I can for enemies shooting at players. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't, I'll say, sorry about that, but I'll have the solution posted soon. So I'm gonna copy in my um, constructor for, um, for a projectile from my example here to save some time. And uh, so I apologize in advance for the shortcut and I'm also gonna paste in my um, instance variables because there's quite a bit going on here um, and I wanna get it done. But it's a little bit more of a complicated model, but it's not complicated. It has more detail, I guess, is the best way of putting it. So first of all, I'm gonna put in my um, variables here and I'll just very quickly explain them. Evil, is this gonna be a good guy's bullet or a bad guy's bullet? And I'm gonna try not to use that in a bunch of if statements to determine my target, but I am gonna use that. I'll have it just in case I need to know it and I'm gonna use it to pick their costumes. Uh, act count, I'm actually gonna animate the projectile because I can always bite off more than I chew for these demos. Um, so I'm going to actually try to make it so that the projectile, I don't know if you noticed it had six different images. That's actually three images for two different colors of projectile. If I go back to the folder here, just so you can see, I have this good guy projectile, which is gonna be fire color, right? It's kind of gonna alternate orange, yellow, red, and the you can't see it on here, but the core of it is a different color. So that's like orange with red in the middle, and that's yellow with orange in the middle, and that's orange with yellow in the middle, or something like that, I don't know. I tried to make it so that if I flickered them, that it would look cool. And these are the bad guy projectiles, green, sort of pink and purple, but there's pink in there, or purple in there. It's I hope it looks good, I haven't actually seen it in action. So that's why I have a bit of extra work here um, with, uh, with the code, like act count is basically so I know if I'm gonna animate to the next, if I'm gonna switch to the next costume yet. Now class I'm gonna talk about in a minute, this is tricky, this is gonna tell it what type of class am I seeking, what, who am I after here? And using class as a variable type is kind of tricky and I might trip on that. So if I do, I apologize in advance, I wasn't able to fully flesh out my example to test it on time because I was giving a lot of kids extra help before and well, that's important and if I don't, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but I will fix it. I think it's gonna work. All right, here's my array of images. So if you're in grade 11, you don't own arrays yet, it's just basically more than one image and they're associated with one 
thing. So images is going to be the images that I'm going to rotate through. It's going to be three. It's going to go one. It's going to go zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two. Image index is going to be, is that a zero, a one, or a two right now? So I know what the next image is. Target X and target Y is where I am flying towards. So I can make sure that I, there's a problem with precision in angles. And as long as I keep turning towards the same angle, it'll be just fine. The, there's a way to fix it with making a precise rotation instead of an integer rotation. You have to turn it into a double, but I'm not going to do that because I don't have time right now. Uh, and finally, damage is how much damage is this projectile going to do when it gets when it hits its target? Uh, I'm going to bring in the constructor here, and I'll sort of explain that to you. And so, the class is who I'm after, and we'll deal with that in a minute. Target X and Y is where I'm pointed. These are not heat-seeking missiles. These are directional. These are all going to be directional projectiles. With more time, we could also make some heat-seeking ones or some enemy-seeking ones that would follow enemies. You know, um, that's a cool thing to do. But for this, we're going to keep it simple. Whether this is an evil projectile or not. Um, so basically, for now, just going to determine the color, um, the speed that it's going to move at, and the amount of damage it's going to do. So we pass these values in when we create a projectile. And when the player creates them, they could be different than when the enemy creates them. Maybe the player's projectiles will move faster, but do less damage, or move faster and do more damage. We're starting our act count at zero. This is simply going to count how many acts have passed. Uh, we're just going to count up. We're never going to hit two billion. Uh, two billion acts would take a very long time, about two weeks, I think. Uh, no more. We're not going to do that. So we're not going to worry about act count getting out of hand. We're just going to keep counting up. Image index is just going to go 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2 to flick through my images for me. How much damage I'm saving. I'm saving my target so I know which way to fly towards. Um, and am I evil? What class am I after? I'm just saving this stuff. Now, here I'm making this temp digit. And this has nothing to do with anything except my file naming structure. Let me show you my file names. So my file names are either projectile 0, 0, 0, 1, or 0, 2, or it starts with a 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. So it's either a 0 for the first numerical digit or a 1. And this is basically saying, if it's evil, make it the 1. Otherwise, it's going to be the 0. I make a new array to hold three images, and I use a for loop to populate it with building a file name. And I put this in two steps just so it's clear. I'm building the file name of, this, of the projectile that I want to import, and then I'm going to add the, the digit, which is either a one or a zero, and then i is going to be which image number. And effectively, this is going to let me load all three of the correct images. And then I'm going to set the zero with one as my image. So far, so good. Um, here I'm going to say turn towards target x, target. You know, I'm going to put that in added to world instead. Let's do it here. We need an added to world method, sorry. Public void added to world, world w. And so when we get added to the world, so up here we can't change things like our direction. We can't turn towards the player. Um, we can't turn towards our target, rather. We can't turn towards a position when we're not in the world yet. And that's why we have to save it. Because if we could do it here, we wouldn't actually have to save the x and the y. We could just turn towards it. But um, because of um, the fact that we're not in the world yet, we can't turn. And this is when we're in the world. So when we get in the world, we're going to turn towards target x and target y, which were saved right here. Okay, So it'll be turn towards target x, target y. We're also going to move out a little bit when we enter the world. And I don't know exactly how far we want to move. I think about 16. And the reason is that we're going to appear at the same place as the, th the thing that spawned us. So when the player spawns a bullet, it's going to spawn right on top of the player. Um, right, It's going to spawn right on top of the player, um, right in the middle of the player. And we don't want it to spawn right on top of the player. We want it to sort of spawn in front of the player. Because when you shoot, usually it doesn't come from your middle. It comes from sort of in front of you. So that's why it's going to move. And I believe the player was 32 pixels wide. So, well, we'll see if it looks good. And then all we have to do here uh, is move at our speed. So move speed and say if, uh, so we, we want to do two things. We want to check for collisions and we want to check for the edge. Uh, but for now, we're just going to check for the edge. So I'm going to say if is at edge. This is a actor method call that checks if I'm at the edge of the world. And I'm going to say get world. Oh, we have the world. I don't need to get the world. No. Uh, no, sorry, I'm thinking of enemy. We don't have it here. Get world dot remove object 
this, which will say when I get to the edge, move me, remove me from the world. Let's see if we can make the player shoot now. The player's gonna have to provide all this stuff to shoot. Um, now, let's see if we can make that work. So player, I'm gonna say here, if the mouse is clicked. So to see if this mouse is clicked, we're already, now let's just go back here for a second. We're in the middle of the mouse info method. So the mouse info method is, I'm sorry, the act method where we've gotten the mouse info and we've checked if mouse is not equal null. Previously, we just used this to turn, but now we're gonna aim to use this also to shoot. So the code for uh, mouse button checking is get button on the mouse info. And the if statement would look like this. If mouse dot get button equals equals one. So one happens to be the left or primary mouse button. Three, as it happens, is the right click if you wanted to do something with right click. Two is if they click the scroll wheel. I don't think there's a way for Greenfoot to read up and down from the scroll wheel, practically speaking, but one is the most important ones to know are one is the left, two is the, or sorry, three is the right. So I'm gonna say, if that's the case, then I wanna add a new projectile. Um, I'm gonna just grab my code here because it's a long line of code. Um, the projectile has a bunch of things in its constructor. So I need to tell it that I wanna be a projectile. I'm gonna chase after enemy.class. I don't think we have, oh, we do, we have an enemy.class. So far it's pretty empty, but it's there. I wanna chase after enemy.class. I wanna target the mouse's X and Y coordinates. So that's what I'm gonna face when I before I fire. Um, it's gonna be, uh, False means I'm not evil, I'm the player's bullet. That's my speed, 6.0. And what was three again? Three is the, oh, how much damage I'm gonna do. So that's how much damage I'm gonna do. And I'm calling the add object method, I'm gonna add it at my current X and Y coordinate. So this is the player's code. So get X and get Y means put the bullet in the world, the projectile in the world where I am. All right, let's see if that works. We're already ahead of where I got in the demo, in my uh, little code demo here. So let's find out if that works. Oh, no, I got an error. Let's find out. Java file not found exception, projectile zero, zero. Oh, oh, I think I might have projectile. Did I forget the dot PNG? Oh, I did. Plus dot PNG. That's good to know. I told you I got further than my demo. And projectile 03. Let's see, why can I not find projectile? Did I count too high? Less than or equals, oh, it's less than or equals two. That's why, sorry guys. There we go. <whistles> nice. Those are cool looking projectiles. Um, I don't see them animating though. Oh, I know why. Okay, so let's go back into our projectile for a minute. There's a couple things we need to do. First of all, that is some wild shooting. We're probably gonna wanna have a cooldown, but we'll see, we'll work on that in a minute the um, animations are not happening because I haven't actually added that to the act method. So let's finish that part up. So I need to count every act. Um, I need to, so I need to count every act. And basically I need to say, if um, I've gotten to a certain point, then I want to change my image. So act count is just going to increase this variable we created up here. It's a simple integer. It starts at zero and every act it counts up by one. And this is just going to let us know how often, um, how many acts have passed. We're actually going to use that with modulus to say every 12 acts or every time it divides evenly by 12 um, that we're going to uh, go to the next image. Okay, so that we could change this number. If we made this number smaller, it would animate faster. And if we made this number shorter, it would animate slower. And we can try different ones. Oh, let's try six, actually. I don't even know what it's gonna look like because I told you this is about as far as I got in my little demo, in my little practice run. Um, so image index plus plus um, means that we're gonna go to the next value. And if we've gotten to the end, I could have used math.min again here, but I just thought I'd use a nice simple way. If I've gotten to the length, so length is too high. Remember, you can't look at it, you can't use the length ver value of an array. That's, that's one more than its highest index. Uh, then I set it back to zero. And finally, I set the image accordingly. Uh, okay, so let's see if that works. Now I should be, able, yeah, there they go. Now my things are flashing, which is kind of cool. 
All right, and I'm gonna have to implement a bit of a cooldown here because this might make my game a little bit too easy. Maybe. Um, so let's try to um, implement a simple cooldown mechanism. Um, so in my player where I'm doing the shooting, I don't actually have an act counter here. Let's make a, um, let's use time. So I'll do a very simple implementation of time here. Private, long, last shot, private, um, private int. No, you know what, let's use acts. This is, I, I don't wanna, we're running out of time and I just wanna keep it simple. So let's just use an act counter, private int act counter. And we'll just do the same thing we did in that other class, act counter. If I, in a perfect world, I could use one act counter in the world. There's lots of ways I could make this, oops, act counter equals zero, sorry. I could make this simpler in a lot of good ways, but, um, sorry, I could make this better in a lot of good ways, but of course, time is of the essence here and I wanna keep it moving. So now I'm gonna have an act counter, and every time I shoot, I'm just gonna say, um, if mouse button equals one, and last shot minus act, we have to make that act counter is greater than cooldown. Okay, so let's just think about this. I just made this up as I went along. It doesn't make sense yet. Uh, so last shot is gonna be, when did I do my last shot? So we're gonna need a variable to keep track of that. And I'm gonna need cooldown to see how many acts is my cooldown. So let's make a last shot and a cooldown. Um, private int last shot, private int cooldown. So uh, last shot will start off as zero. Last shot equals zero, because uh, we didn't shoot yet. And cooldown equals, let's call it 20. So 20 is uh, gonna be about a third of a second. So we'll have to actually be careful with our shooting. We can't just shoot, 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 and win the game. Uh, so cooldown equals 20. And uh, when I shoot, I'm gonna say last shot equals act counter. Oh, what's going on? Cooldown, cannot find symbol, cooldown, cooldown. Cool down. Let's get rid of that. Cool down could be one word. I think it's a compound word. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, act counter increases. When I do shoot, it'll send the last shot to the out counter. If it's last shot minus, no, it's act counter minus last shot. Act counter minus last shot will give me a positive number. And let's try that out. Let's see if that limits my shooting a bit. There we go. Now I'm limited and I can still hold down the button. You could program it to make yourself release the mouse button um, in order for this to happen, but this is kind of good. All right, so that's some, and now let's make, see if we can make it hit the enemies. That was the other thing I was worried about when I was using that sort of class implementation there. Um, the movement feels really good. The shooting feels really nice. And I like the way those projectiles look. Well, let's see if they can hit enemies. So. Projectile, currently all it does is check for the edge, but we really need to check, hey, uh, am I intersecting an enemy? So after I moved, I wanna check if I'm touching an enemy of the class that I'm after. And to do that, I'm gonna use a code. I'm gonna use some simple collision detection. You could use better collision detection with more time. I'm gonna use get one intersecting object, which is not the best in the terms of efficiency. It uses quite a bit of CPU cycles, but it's the best in terms of quick and easy to use, which is really what I'm after here with about six minutes left to go. Um, so this is the class of, should be enemy, if I set this right, right? I set this, I said enemy.class, I think that'll work. Good luck me. Uh, and then I'm gonna say if, if uh, let's say, if it's not null, if a is not equal to null, now here I'm into a bit of a pickle. I wanted this to be, I'm not even gonna explain why, I'm just gonna make it, I'm just gonna code it. I'm gonna say if a instance of player, else if a, a instance of enemy. This isn't the ideal way to do this. Um, it would be more ideal to use the same dot class thing, but I wanted to make sure this actually worked. And so I have to go with what I know is gonna work instead of the 
I, I would like to fidget with it, make it a little different, but this will work, I think. So if uh, let's make them. If I'm in the enemy, um, I'm going to turn the into an enemy. Enemy e equals. This is again casting. If I know it's an enemy, I can cast the actor into an enemy. In other words, this is an actor, right? I got an actor because get one intersecting object will always return an actor, and you can't program that to return something different. But once I get the result, I'm going to actually say if I know it's an enemy, then I want to turn it into an enemy. And why am I doing this? Because then I can call methods an enemy. Uh, or in this case, I'm not going to give my enemy hit points. I'm just going to say uh, get world dot remove object e. So in other words, when I hit my enemy, he's just going to get destroyed. I could instead call a method on on e here. Um, if this was the player, I would want to. Maybe I'll change that in a few minutes, which is why I put this here. But for I could have put a here. But so you see kind of how you can grab enemy. If there was a method like e dot blow up, you know, like to make him have some kind of effects, you could do that instead, you could call those methods. But for now, I want to keep it simple and do that. So let's see if that works. I should now be able to shoot and remove the enemies. Please, he went away. And so did he. Uh, so that's good. The enemy dot class thing did work. So I'm happy with that. Now I've got to get the enemies to shoot back at the player. Um, the player does he have hit points yet? Yes, he does. He's got 50 hit points. So he needs a method to get hit. Um, so we need a hit me method effectively. And so I'm going to grab a simple hit me method that I coded earlier. And this is another one of those methods. If you're new to me talking about modular reusable code all the time, this is one of those things that's always applicable. Getting hit for damage is math.max either zero or hit points minus damage. So in other words, if you have 10 hit points left and you get hit for 20, most games don't want to hear negative 10. They just want oh, zero hit points knocked out. You're done. Um, we don't want the value negative 10. So this is just instead of using some if statements to set it to zero, it's using math.max. And since we don't have an end screen yet, I put greenfoot.stop uh, if I've reached zero. I might make this less than or equal to zero just to be safe, but I'm pretty confident in my code here that would that would floor it at zero. So I think we're OK. And let's see if that works. Uh, oh, the enemies can't shoot me yet. Let's make the enemies shoot. We're just about out of time, but I think we can fit in that one more thing. Uh, I'm going to make the enemies uh, shoot on a cooldown. So let's make another act counter. Okay, and. Um, And uh, act counter plus plus, and then I'm going to say if act counter modulus 30 equals zero. Now I want to make an evil projectile. I haven't even tested evil projectiles yet, but let's grab the constructor from projectiles so I'll know what I need, and let's see if we can uh, figure that out. So these are the things I need to pass it. Um, All right, so I'm going to say add object new projectile, and we need a class, so it's going to be player.class is what I'm after. Uh, target x, target y. So did I give myself a ref? Yes, I'm going to tar always shoot at the player. Player.get x, and then for the y, it's going to be player.get y. In other words, he's always going to shoot right at wherever the player is. And he's going to be evil, so this is going to be true, which should hopefully give it the other graphics. And the projectile speed, let's make them, I don't know, 7.0. We'll see how that feels. And we'll make them do f 10 damage. So for these ones, if you get hit five times, you would die because you have 50 hit points. And we want to add them at the enemy's position. So let's get X, get Y, because we are in the enemy right now. All right. And what did I do wrong? Method projectile int int. Oh, then I did something wrong. New projectile. Oh, sorry, it's get world. Get world dot add object. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so we're just pretty much out of time, so let's really hope this works. Are the enemies gonna start shooting me? Whoa. Oh they are. And can I die? Well, no. That's disappointing. Why are they not hitting me? Oh, I don't think. Oh, I know why. Sorry. Last thing. 
projectile. I don't think I programmed to hit the player. I said if it's enemy. All right, so uh, player p equals player p uh, a, and then p dot hit me damage. On that, my students and my friends should work. Let's see if I can die now. Boom. Uh, oh, I didn't. The projectiles aren't removing themselves, so one projectile just killed me. Let's just polish off that one little problem there. Uh, the projectiles need to remove itself from the world after they do hits. But if I put this here, uh, I'm going to have a problem if I remove them here, because then I'll get back to this code and it won't work. So I can only do this once. I'm going to set a boolean here. A uh, really easy way to fix this. Private boolean remove. Remove. And I'm going to set remove to be false from the beginning of the program. Remove equals false. But then when I finally hit something, if A is not equal to null, if I hit my target, I'm going to say remove equals true. And I'm going to say remove equals true. And I'm going to say if at edge or remove, then get rid of the object. And let's see if this now will fix shoot me enemies and now I take and I died on the fifth hit which is correct and my basic functionality works so what do we have here we don't necessarily have everything we would want to make this game complete but I think in about 47 minutes I've got this cool motion I've got some shooting that's uh, towards the mouse I've got ugh, I'm not very good at it um, it'll always run towards the mouse so I can have some fun with that and these enemies are kind of a little hard for the first level of the game, but hey, yeah, I'm not very good at this. I'll have to tune the uh, balance, but all the features work and um, I think it looks kind of neat. Uh, simple shapes, simple shapes, animation, right? I just change the colors and then when I run it, they look kind of cool. Um, so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to share this right now to the Greenfoot Gallery. Uh, so if you are interested, you can grab it. And I'm going to call it a work in progress because I would love to pick up and do a part two on this. Where first of all, um, we're going to um, first of all we're going to smooth things up with a little bit of game balance there to make it a little bit less deadly and impossible. Um, but we can also add things like progressive difficulty and um, you know other elements like maybe the player can have some friends which I already created the graphics for and would be pretty easy to implement if we could start right here and have a ton more time. I see that quite a few people tuned in today which I think is awesome. Uh, a total of uh, I don't know what playbacks means but it says 78 and I've had concurrent viewership as high as 20 so I guess that's good. I'm not used to watching the screen. I don't really know what it means, but I'm glad you guys tuned in. Uh, well, let's call this the 45 minute shooter um, tutorial part one. I hope you enjoyed. And maybe I'll post a link to this stream once it's posted. Uh, so anyone who missed it can also go check it out. Uh, I'm going to publish that right now before I even get off with you guys. And then you can take it up there. After I get off with you, I will also comment it up and republish it. So if, you, if you're dying to grab it, it's now officially on the Greenfoot Gallery with absolutely no commenting. Um, but, or almost, I shouldn't say absolutely, I did put one comment in there with Excel, Decel, and Stop. Um, but it's basically commentless. I know that you probably would rather have comments. Uh, so I'll touch it up and I will repost it a little bit later this afternoon. I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Um, it really is, you know, my pleasure to do these kind of Greenfoot tutorials with you. I think a lot of people learn best this way. If you're in my grade 11 class right now, we do a lot of learning by example, with even starting with simple things like before we learn graphics, we still can learn a few simple game. I'll build a few uh, certain games. We'll have a class that kind of runs like this. Grade 12s, there'll be a few demos, days like this where we do stuff like this. And um, I always take requests. So if there's a feature you're looking to implement, if you have ideas and you're not sure how to, how to make it work, ask me and sometimes I'll just give you an answer and other times I'll go, hey, that's a great thing. I'm gonna implement that in the next, in the next tutorial. Uh, so thank you guys all for uh, joining me. I'm gonna sign off now. Have yourselves a fantastic afternoon and hopefully I will see you for part two at some point in the future.